privilege of introducing what I would say is uh, an all-star panel, uh, for sure. To my immediate left is Paul Kane, and Paul is the group president and chief revenue officer of Time, Inc. And Carl Fremont, uh, next to Paul, is the executive vice president and media director at Digitas. Terry Gallo is vice president of programmatic practice at the media brand's audience platform, Cadrion. And Amanda Richman, who's president of digital for MediaVest, and Vivek Shah, who is CEO of Ziff Davis. So, all star indeed. So, we're going to get right into it this morning. I'm going to ask uh, uh, the first question will be a, a focus uh, to Amanda and Carl uh, on the agency side. And I'd love to begin the discussion by talking about um, how programmatic buying uh, kind of affects your world. Uh, how your agencies have adopted it. Uh, we'll get into uh, a discussion about talent uh, a little later. But can you just uh, start us off with a couple of comments uh, in general about what programmatic buying uh, means from, from an agency standpoint? Sure yeah, we've been on a bit of an evolution in the space for the last three years at MediaVest, starting really with just pure experimentation with our DR clients and focusing on helping them understand the space, see how we can use this as part of the, the platform and the approach that we have around audience strategy. Um, from a pure digital team focus as well, into now I'd say three years later across both uh, brand building clients, but also across the agency, with our television teams being more actively involved, and particularly having this uh, leap now from it being kind of the digital space to an area where our strategy and planning teams are more deeply involved too, understanding that so much data and insights can be gleaned from this platform and opportunity. So it's been nice to see the evolution from just a buying kind of platform technology approach now into thinking about is really the data hub and how we can be integrating this across all of our buying strategies. From a growth standpoint, um, I would estimate that programmatic buying year over year in the last three years has grown 30 to 40 percent. Um, and it, it when, when you say, Carl, I just want to clarify year. that. So 30 to 40 percent, and is that when you say, is that on revenue? On monies spent on it, on or on spent. impressions bought, or I, I'd say the amount we invest in programmatic buying um, and planning has grown thirty percent year over year. How much we invest in it? Okay. Um, on average, um, there are certain businesses where it has grown even more. It is an integral part of the way we plan and strategize and buy today. Well, I know we'll talk about talent and the mm -hmm. impact that has, but from a pure business side, it is a critical part of what we do. Great. And how about on, on the publishing side, to Paul and, and Vivek, how has this uh, affected your, your daily operations, and how do you view programmatic buying today? Uh, it, it's affected it quite a bit. We've seen, we've seen the, the change, uh, the buying side, where programmatic is becoming far more important. We launched a product called Time Exchange this year, which allowed us to get into a private exchange opportunity with our clients. And we've seen uh, not only a combination of experimentation on there from a client standpoint, but a significant growth in terms of revenue allocation through that channel. But overall, it's really about, it's about uh, taking advantage of not just the programmatic aspect of it, but also the holistic side of the buying. Because although you're seeing an increase in it, it's, part, it's, a, it's an important component to it and it's a component because it really allows the, uh, you to use the data that we've got and, and to basically target the audiences in a much better, more efficient way. So for that reason, we think it's an important thing for all of us to be much more involved in. So key, key for you then is to Rajiv's uh, point earlier about a, a holistic platform. Um, it, is a, it is a part of uh, the process. Absolutely. And uh, we see it not just on the digital side, but we see a need growing on the offline side too. because. Data buying and data targeting, both online and offline, is becoming far more important across the board. I want to get back to that in a minute, but Vivek, yeah, so, um, yeah. at Ziff Davis, obviously, uh, you know a, a thing or two about uh, about data uh, and about this subject. So, <laughs> um, there you so go. you know, I I think of programmatic selling uh, as a big opportunity for publishers, but I don't think of it in the sense of you know you've got unsold inventory, you've got remnant owned and operated inventory and liquidate them in the exchange universe. I just don't think the unit economics are great uh, for publishers to do that. I think if, you know, I think you try to sell your inventory directly and, and if you don't, I'm not sure those are marketplaces I participate in. We don't. Where I see the opportunity 
is when you look into the world of RTB, you have 25 billion impressions every day that you can bid on. And I think the opportunity for publishers on behalf of their clients, marketers, to figure out which of those impressions do you want to bid on, the marketer, <coughs> what price do you want to pay, and how do you want to fill that inventory. That, to me, is what really helps determine what of that huge universe of inventory they should buy. And by the way, that, in, in, that universe grows, I mean, incredibly fast. When we launched a business called Buyerbase, which does this, which takes data from our owned and operated properties, from 150 other partners within the tech ecosystem, we collect data through our own data management platform, and then action that data at the exchanges across the same inventory that anyone can access. When we launched that business um, in early 2011, there were 300 million impressions a day you could bid on. Today, it's 25 billion. And in fact, with Facebook Exchange, you probably are north of 30 billion impressions a day. So m my point is, I think there are a lot of people trying to solve the what's the right inventory to trade. And I think publishers have a rightful spot in that ecosystem as much as anyone else. And by the way, I don't think there's just one entity that's going to solve that for each client. I think when you have that universe of, of opportunity to buy, agencies play an incredibly important role, publishers play an, in, in, an incredibly important role, and I think other ad technology, other data-driven display players. So I just, you know, when we did this in early 2011, I remember coming to you know, panels saying publishers should be launching publisher trading desks. And you know, it's almost two years later, and I don't see it, and I'm surprised, because it's still around, well, I've got 30% of my inventory, and I'm not going to get yield out of that 30% that I don't sell. The math there is an incredibly attractive. Getting a piece of what is almost an infinite amount of inventory, 25 billion impressions a day that's just scaling, is really interesting. Insert yourself into that value exchange, because it can be very attractive. Yeah, I think you know it's, it, it's very interesting, because if you think about uh, you know, television inventory, sort of classic uh, media, that is by very definition, uh, it is the definition of scarcity. Uh, we don't have infinite inventory. Um, and you know, thus the upfronts, thus the, uh, the lack of automated buying um, in that industry. But uh, you know, we, we will never ever suffer uh, in the digital space for a lack of inventory. And it's really changed uh, so much uh, about the process of, of buying and selling. So Terry, you're right in the middle of this at, at Cadre. You're in the middle of the panel, and you're in the right. middle of all of it right. uh, at uh, IPG's Cadreon. Um, so what do you see going on in, in the world of programmatic buying, and, and how has it changed uh, a big holding company like, like IPG? For, for us, um, when we started Cadreon about three and a half years ago to support one of our clients, Microsoft, it was a bit of a nascent activity. Um, now programmatic really sits at the center of what we're doing in the digital space. So um, we actually believe that programmatic is actively transforming, but will continue to transform the way digital media um, is <coughs> acquired and managed. So not just display, but we're really active. We just launched a TV product. We're doing digital at home, we've got video. So across all of the different disciplines, programmatic is actually a key driver in the work that we do from a digital perspective. Um, data, holistic management, um, all play into it. We actually um, see that happening quite rapidly and it's transforming our activity. Sure. So I'm looking at this group and, and realizing that you represent uh, either directly uh, at Time Inc. Uh, or at Ziff Davis uh, or indirectly. Uh, some of the most important uh, companies in the world. Um, you just When you said Microsoft, a client, not just any client. Uh, but you do represent some of the most important brands uh, in the world. And I think, you know, Paul, I'll look at you, the uh, extraordinary uh, asset base that you have uh, in the Time Inc. brands. Does, is this something that you ever saw coming? Uh, I think that, you know, so many uh, selling organizations uh, prided themselves on their ability to create relationships uh, with people like Carl and, and Amanda and Terry. Um, is this something you ever could have foreseen? Is it? Are you comfortable wearing this suit? Comfortable in this suit? Yeah, it looks great, by the oh, way. Thank it's you. Like, you're welcome. The, uh, <laughs> you know, it's it's always hard to predict. I think we did see a couple of years ago that th this side of the business was growing immensely. We just weren't always clear on 
what role we wanted to play in it because we protected our inventory as premium inventory for a very long time. And our, we also protected our direct relationship with the clients in a, in a highly protective way. Neither of that has changed. We're still very protective of our premium inventory and our client direct relationships. What this really represents is a style of buying that's been there almost since day one, which is somewhat of the always on efficiency based mm -hmm. type of buying that has existed in media for a very long time. Our cho uh, we have chosen in, for many years not to participate in an RTB or an open exchange type of environment in order to protect that. But I think what's happened is because of the style of buying has changed to accomplish the always on and then the pulses and then the premium inventory, it allowed us now the opportunity to enter it in a safe way that didn't necessarily create that kind of ch that risk. You know, the one thing that we always have to watch out for is, uh, is first our consumers, secondly is the protection of our brand, but the third is our protection of our relationship that the clients have with our consumers and ultimately through our brand. You know, our goal is to not just put excess inventory up there. That's not the whole point. Our goal is not to just make us, uh, is to focus entirely on you know, responding to the market. Our goal is to help our clients gain better access to these consumers in a premium way by, by making the, the buying opportunity parallel to the way that they want to buy. And it didn't devalue which is what's no. most important. Our view is that that inventory is still of high value. It's just being accommodated to the type, as you said, all the type of buying that we are doing today. Exactly. So when you, when you think about it, I mean, Paul, you said a, a couple of things that uh, I think are, are on people's minds uh, when they think about uh, programmatic buying, and, and, and one of them is brand safety. Uh, and I think another one is, and again, you mentioned it, is the quality of, of that inventory uh, and the issue of transparency. Uh, so I would ask, ask you, are we, are we where we need to be today uh, on those issues? I would also add uh, creative in there. Uh, so when you think about uh, where we were a few years ago and some of the advances that we've made in the issues of quality inventory, transparency, brand safety, uh, creative, how are we doing? Are, are we there yet? I, I believe we made leaps from where we were three years ago in the brand safety, um, in the quality of the inventory, the transparency, major leaps, which is why I believe it has um, grown as much and been accepted as much because of that. Also, the opening of the amount of inventory and where the inventory comes from and the ability to have open discussions about the type of audiences we're looking to achieve. And I believe the more transparency we have on our side, the agency side, about who we're looking to reach and how we can and do that, as well as on the publisher side, transparency about who that audience is from the data, what part of that data is modeled versus what is actual data. That is something I still believe we need to work a little bit on, on that transparency. Um, to understand how the, the audiences are accumulated and how the data is being used. But I believe in general, we've made big leaps from where we were, which has enabled the growth. That's I'm actually, at, I'm sorry, yeah. no, but that, I just want to add to that. That's yeah. actually a fantastic point that's really important is it does come back to a combination of the inventory and the data. You know, the and data is a big driver of this and what the quality of the data has. You know, we have... We have, had, we have a direct relationship with our consumers. We have, we know, we have 65 million households in our database that we have uh, a lot of information on, and we're, able, and we're working towards marrying our offline data and our online data to make that even more robust. That, that to us is a really important non, component. Non-PII, though. Non-PII, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Got caught but, in that storm a few years ago. Yes, so. you're right. <laughs> but it's, it's a really important point because the value of that data is ultimately going to protect what V and I were talking about in terms of the value of this inventory is the strong data creates better inventory, ultimately a better CPM. And if we can offer that in a multi-tiered way, then it's a better value to our advertisers. I think that's important. I, I do think that there is a sort of opacity around how this data gets constructed. And I think all of us who trade in this world recognize that the advertiser data is the data that's driving a lot of the excess returns. And in fact, either directly by taking their data and doing retargeting, or what I see lots of people do with go to an advertiser and say, listen, just drop this pixel, we're going to use it for optimization. Really all it is is adding that layer of really high quality water to some low quality water to make it taste right. And I think 
the reality is that stuff needs to get exposed because I think, you know, it's unclear to me, and, and we trade a lot, it's unclear to me how much data that's available in the marketplace to acquire to rent is providing excess returns when you account for taking the advertiser data out. <coughs> and that, I think, is, you know, one of those things we don't always talk about it. And by the way, I think you have to deliver excess return. I mean, this is, this is a perform, and however you define returns, right, whether it's a sale action or a brand lift, whatever that action is, it's got to be better than if I just went out and, and closed my eyes and bought off an exchange. And so excess is critical, and I don't think there's a lot of clarity on well, where did this data come from? Was it acquired in a way that the publisher and the consumer understood? Were the opt-outs that you, we as an industry have all agreed to uh, adhere to are in place? I think there are a lot of questions like that uh, that are still unanswered. In our so space. Amanda, you, you represent some of the absolutely best brands in the world from Procter & Gamble to Coca-Cola to Walmart, uh, et cetera. So uh, what are your clients saying about this? Are, are they feeling that we've come a long way in those issues of uh, particularly uh, transparency and, and brand safety here? I would agree with Paul, uh, Carl, and Viv as well, that we've seen great progress in this area. There's still some concern, but you're seeing a lot less of it than in the day of early ad networks and a lot of the issues being bubbled up there. Where I see more of the conversation shifting now, though, is not just focused on data transparency and the technology and systems and inventory, but on the addressable messaging and actually the context and creative. To the, your last part of your question, when I don't think we've made hardly any progress there, right. other than certainly work with dynamic creative optimization companies, and, and we can work with different <coughs> data streams to make messages more relevant, but we're not really engaging creative agencies to bring more emotion into this platform through better yeah, context it's, it's and so, messaging. It, this is such an interesting point, because we're, we're 17 years into the, into the revolution now, um, and we've done a really lousy job uh, in general uh, from a creative standpoint. Uh, in, in online, you know, people say, oh, you know, you don't see, uh, you know, advertising online, you know, that, that, you know, makes you laugh or makes you cry. I see plenty of it that makes me cry uh, from a creative standpoint. It's pretty, pretty awful. Um, and, you know, I'm thinking an awful lot, uh, as I think everybody in the industry is these days, about mobile uh, and how very far away uh, we are uh, from understanding what the consumer uh, is interested in, will tolerate, et cetera. We're so far away there. Uh, from creative as well. So um, to this point, other panelists, is this an issue for you? Are you concerned about uh, about the quality of the, the creative? Does this come up on your, your radar screen with the other issues of brand safety, transparency, et cetera? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, creative is, we. I think we as an industry have done such a great job at looking at data, figuring out what data sets work, whether they're publisher-owned or client-owned, optimizing that against media, integrating fantastic platforms, but the last piece, which tends to be the most critical, is the message, and that, I would say, 98% of the time is not aligned with the effort that goes into the optimization up front. So, you know, just like uh, Amanda, we're, we're trying to figure out how do we do a better job of activating and prophesizing, if you will, programmatic into the creative agencies to ensure that we've got sort of that full circle of optimization. So certainly a big challenge for us. I, I think we need to make it sexy. It's just not viewed as the big brand things that get awards. As an industry, I, I believe we need to, all of us together, along with publishers, agencies, marketers, to make this something that is sexy. Because what gets attention is the big brand work that we see. And that gets everyone's attention. That's where then everyone believes that the money is <laughs> migrating to, which it's not. It is in, in this area. We need to do that. And at one point, you know, interesting looking back to look forward, I come from a, a world of direct marketing. And the copywriter used to be revered for because they knew how to take a few words, a few sentences, and turn them into action. And they were really revered. And I believe uh, we need to kind of get back to some of that basics about looking at uh, not just the creative, but the offer, the message, and how to make them sexy and how to make them actionable. So this, um, this actually speaks to both sides of the life that I've lived here at Time Inc. is that on the one side, on the, on the revenue side of it, we spend a lot of time talking about buying. All different types of buying procedures, programmatic buying, real-time bidding, direct sales, all the CPMs. 
And then on the content side of it, we talk about connecting to the consumer in it, through the device and being very specific to it. Like Time is launching on uh, their, their responsive design product. And it's when you look at what Time and People did, People did it in July, and Time's doing it now, when you look at what they're doing, they're growing their relationship with the consumers because they're thinking about the creative, the content, the way it's presented, the, the style of it for the device, for the screen, and ultimately they're watching engagements go up and, and their uniques go up. We're not seeing that necessarily on the creative side of it, and that's one of our, uh, as a publisher, that's one of our frustrations is we, and we've been talking to our partners of, to develop adaptive advertising, to adapt, to develop uh, creative that, that drives messaging that's comparable or more effective than what the content does. We see that on television, we see that in print, we'd love to see that more in digital and mobile. Yeah, it's eluded us for, for a long, long time. Um, but, but maybe that takes us to sort of the, the next part of the discussion, which would be, on talent, you know, if you think about um, the way that you used to hire, what skills were the most important to you, whether you're on the buy side or the sell side, um, <coughs> the skill sets, given given the the math, science, and technology of it all, um, what's what's really changed for you from from a hiring perspective uh, on on either side of it, Terry? Well, I think you know, for us, the sort of the message is a capacity and knowledge of analytics with a marketing mindset. So if you can combine and find the individual who actually has a passion and desire to understand digital marketing from an analytics perspective, but also always with a lens and an eye to a client and what they need from a marketing perspective. How, how difficult is that to find? Um, it, it's been difficult, but I think that you know there are certain folks, I see people from the team laughing, but um, you know, we've been successful at what we think has been recruiting some really good talent, um, and you know, it's 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 emerging, uh, just like digital was 19 years ago or so when I started. I mean, there were very few people that thought about this, but there are now there's so much focus in programmatic today that younger people, others are starting to turn the lens towards it. Amanda, where do you find them? Yeah. I would say data and analytics is certainly the starting point. I mean, analytics mindset, capability, but we've also learned that you can't have that as just the green speed alone. Right. You really need to look for those big thinkers, right. the connected mindset. And I'd say also collaboration is a skill that is so necessary in this space. You know, as much as this is about technology and we talk about platforms and automation, there is more people interaction in this space than I think any of us anticipated. And that's all about bringing teams together, sharing the insights, sharing the data, where it used to be maybe hoarded in separate silos and territories. So having that collaboration on top of analytical mindset is, is what we see to be. Is it, is it challenging to find people? Where, where do you find these people? Pragmatic conferences? We're not going to <laughs> there we, go. Yeah, exactly. we actually find them from each other too yeah. often, and right. we really need to grow the field right. amongst all of us instead of coaching from each other, frankly. That's right. you know, that's from people challenge. who may not have considered even uh, advertising, mm -hmm. they may have considered date some, a, a career in data analytics, um, and they have that mindset. But I also believe, to Amanda's point, we need to look at it right brain and left brain. So it's not just about the data, it's about the insights, pulling the insights and creating um, really creative uses of how to think about the audiences and the data together. Paul, what about the, the sell side or, or Vivek? Are you looking for very different skills in your sales organization these days? And can you find that, that right brain, left brain, or is that a, a hunt for a unicorn? So it's, it's uh, sometimes it's a hunt, but... Um, there's multiple tiers of people that we need now, and we're seeing that uh, our, our needs have gotten much more diverse over the years in terms of, you know, we used to look for a very specific style of salesperson and sales support and, uh, and process teams. Now it's got to be all over the place. We have to match the skill set on the buy side. We need the same level of analytics. We need the same set of, uh, of, of ex basically experiences that we need to help bring over and in addition to what we currently had. So it's been a very stressful side of our, our business. The talent pool is not as, as wide as we would like. We, we're starting to dip into places that we never would have expected. It's way outside the advertising industry. So, and, so for example, think um, of any... We're any... looking for everyone from a, a legal background, an analytics background, an engineering background, um, uh, you know, a, 
sociologists we've looked at. We would look at everywhere you can possibly imagine. And interestingly enough, like not a lot of the, the schools are necessarily producing the talent per se. It's coming out of work experiences. So we're needing to look in other industries and find diverse talent that ultimately is going to uh, fuel what we're trying to do. Our, I, you know, we were talking to some people before about you know the history of Time Inc. And, and especially in this way, and we've like put our toe in the water in lots of different times uh, to do the kind of work we're doing right now. We didn't have, we either didn't have the right marketplace momentum or the right talent pool, but now we need everything, and that's well, that you know, to Amanda's decision. point, collaboration. Uh, yeah. Very difficult to find, you know, find in in uh, one person all of these skills. But but Vec, you uh, are the architect of, of a radical makeover uh, and a very successful one for Ziff Davis. Um, what did you see when you walked in, and, and from a talent standpoint, skills standpoint, and and where are you now? How difficult was it to to remake that in light of talent? Yeah, I mean, I think the the, the critical group for me from the product side are engineers. I mean, you you need world-class engineers to make the kind of products that are going to do the things that we've talked about. So for us, we put a very heavy emphasis on recruiting that talent, which wasn't present. I think on the sales side, the only thing I would say is, you know, the difficulty we had, we have a team of people who sell premium, who go out and sell sponsorship and high-value content and integration and custom units. Those people are kept separate from the buyer base team. And it's a religion issue. It's just, it's hard on one side to believe in data-driven display, the math, the ruthless efficiencies, and then on the other side, talk about what is more the emotional pull and connection. And I think they're both valid, by the way. I, I don't come here and say one is better than the other. I think it's positive sum. I don't think it's negative sum or zero sum. I just kept them apart, because when we try to have you know, someone go in and, and talk about premium and integration and then go in and talk about trading. And by the way, there's a key difference. When you're selling premium, you're selling your own inventory. Buyer base, we don't sell our own inventory. Remember, it's a markup mm -hmm. on exchange inventory, right? So that's a mindset, like it blows people away. Well, what do you mean you're not selling your own ads? <coughs> that doesn't make sense mm -hmm. to me. Why would you do that? Publishers sell their own ads. We don't believe that. But that was a big, I would, mm -hmm. I would never anticipated people would have trouble making that leap, but they did, so we have separate sales teams. Well, it's, great. It's, it, it's quite a fundamental yeah. shift in not only practice, certainly, but in mindset yeah. uh, and perhaps the culture, uh, culture of a company. But I think what, what you just touched on is the, uh, the classic art and science uh, of the advertising business and the um, sort of focus we've had in the last couple of decades on or and a binary uh, <clears throat> black and white approach to um, to a lot of what we do um, because of the science, the math, and, and the technology that uh, has come into the business. So it sort of leaned way to the left, where <clears throat> for decades prior it leaned, you know, way way more toward the art part. And I and think we're we're learning that we need to live in an and world. And I think to give the agency world credit, you, it, the same thing is true. I mean, when you think about what a trading desk is and the departure from what has been the traditional model of an agent, it's extraordinary. Right, And it is a model for, I think, even the media, the publishing side of the industry to look at and say, you know what, they figured out a way to get the technology, the talent, the skill set mm -hmm. to be on that side of the equation. And I think it's going well for, for my colleagues. But that's something that, again, I'd love to see on the, on the content side. Yeah, great. Yeah, there is a bit of a merging of it, wouldn't you say that? that because uh, you know, if you look further down the road, you're going to see the offline world behaving more like the online world and, and vice versa, where, where the type of skill sets we have for our print sellers at this point, looking for that level of engagement, selling that from a qualitative standpoint, we're seeing more of that need on the digital side. And yet, mm -hmm. on, the, on, the, on the offline, we're seeing more of a need of a programmatic uh, database buying and, and analytical buying. So we're seeing it. And even on the agency side, we're seeing more connections between the sides, too. I mean, Amanda's done a great job on her side really merging that. We've had to move to more of an embed model. So where we started with, you know, audience <coughs> demand, BBKey is the trading desk solution coming from a holding company. How do you take some of that talent then into the brand agencies like MediaVest, have people partner up, learn together, and work together so it truly is a one-team effort instead of let's throw that over the wall to the programmatic guys while we focus on the ideas. We've got to bring those two together, and we're hungry for more publishers to be bringing those solutions together as well. So it's great to hear from both of Absolutely. you that you're driving that. So 
do we think as a, as a group that programmatic will uh, start gaining some traction in television and print and radio, outdoor, across all the media channels, or are we a ways away from that? For us, I mean, our strategy has always been cross-channel. We, um, we believe in it. We actually think, you know, it's no, no joke that mobile is um, underspent for the amount of activity. <coughs> I actually think that mobile advertising will grow up with programmatic as, as its DNA, essentially. Um, but we, we recently launched a TV product. We are testing in digital out of home. <coughs> Does it mean next year we're transacting billions of dollars in TV? Absolutely not, but it is a catalyst but you see for what it, we it, think. It coming. Happen. Carl, you yeah. seeing that? Yes, that absolutely. But I, I believe that it won't be so segmented by screens or by medium mm -hmm. as much as by the audience we're right. looking to reach. And then how high can you go based on you know what your allowable is, quote unquote, what you can pay for that audience and how defined de that audience is, is going to be more important than this kind of siloed approach of now I bought in television, now I bought in print. So, so in other words, a more, as they say, platform agnostic correct. approach, Much you see more that audience coming in. Based. Yep. Continue on what we're doing now, but with more inventory from other platforms. Right. I mean, the, the audience and the data is what stitches it together, essentially. Yes. I think so it's, it's leading all of us to really rethink our organizational structures <laughs> as well as a result. Sure. So do you organize by audience then instead of as television, digital, print buyers? Do you organize that on top of the layers of data, have different relationships that are defined that way? Mm. But we're in transition. So it's, it's challenging because you can't take a full leap yet because the, we're not there with all the other channels. Yeah. But over, over the next couple of years, it is going to merge more, and we will have to rethink our talent base because of that. Good. So full employment. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot to do. So let's just go back for, for just a minute uh, just to, to uh, the digital of it all. Um, the, the group seem to think that we, we're in pretty good shape on some of the key issues associated uh, with programmatic buying in, in this space. Where does it go from here? What, what are the things, however, um, that we need to do? Um, to solidify this and to make it very much a, a, an integrated part of everything that we do. Um, so we did talk about you know, the quality of the inventory, the transparency, the creative. Are we missing anything else? Where, where does this all go? Privacy. Privacy. You want to talk about that a little, little bit? Not really. <laughs> <laughs> Any volunteers? <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. I, think, I think the industry has created a great framework. <coughs> I say that. Uh, former chair of the IAB, currently on the IAB, Paul's on the IAB, we worked hard at this. And I think, um, you know, I think the, the opt-out framework works, um, and I hope it persists. It doesn't prevent legislative or other <laughs> regulatory efforts to go further than I think we need to ought to go. So that's something to watch, just as an industry. We're only as good as full participation of the industry, right? So it just takes one or two bad actors in a self-regulatory framework to make people say, well, self-regulation doesn't work because I can point to this person and this person who aren't regulating themselves, right? So um, I think privacy is a big issue. I also think that we have to be careful. I know a later discussion is about viewability. We can't, because I hear this a lot, well, that's going to make sense uh, for certain inventory, but we don't want to do viewability for our TV. I don't think you can do that. I think you have to come to a world where when we get to a set of metrics and standards, it's got to apply to all ads. Not, oh, this is DR ads, and the pricing's built in, it's efficient. <laughs> ah, we know that the chunk of it's not viewable. That's mm -hmm. not going to fly. So I think that, you know, to, to you know, because I feel like then you're hiding something. Oh, well, is there an admission there that a lot of these ads have actually never been seen? So I think privacy and then whatever set of metrics we develop as an industry, standards, beyond the click, making measurement make sense right. type things, it should apply to everything. Absolutely. Terry, you had a, a comment. Yeah, no, I, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think, you know, in some ways, maybe it's just the emergence of programmatic and the sort of path it's taken, but we are, it's not a JV player, right? I mean, it's an integrated, integral part of what we do in digital. And absolutely, I mean, any compliance, any rules of the game that appear sort of through upstream or premium assets certainly should apply. And in some cases, 
need to apply more in probiotics. So I support that. So I suspect that there uh, there are questions in in the audience for this esteemed panel, and uh, we do have a, a couple of minutes left for that. Do you have a roving microphone? Or <coughs> anybody have anything on their mind? Too early. <laughs> One thing I, I just want to kind of make a plea for is that we continue the on the buy side and the sales side to work together. You know, and that's kind of the plea for everybody here because we, uh, for this to continue to grow, I think we need to continue to work together and break down some of the silos and walls that we have between us. We need to be on the agency marketing side open to what we're trying to achieve in terms of our, who we're trying to reach, information about them, and response back. So we need to give you that data back in order to improve. And I think on the sell side, more understanding of what we are trying to achieve and get better at asking the types of questions about what we're trying to solve for. So it's working together as opposed to, I think in some cases we've sat on opposite sides. I think that's a really important point because I think Amanda was the first to, to uh, talk about collaboration this morning. But you know, we have sort of this in incredible ability to adopt, um, you know, the word of the of the week, the month, you know, the year. Uh, by the way, have you all pivoted lately? <laughs> We've pivoted to native uh, advertising. Yeah, and, and to native advertising. And, exactly. like <laughs> and you know exactly stack. where you fit right, in, in the stack. And you know where you are in the stack. Okay, I just I just want <clears> to <throat> check on that. Um, but uh, collaboration, I mean, I, it, it, it's really a no kidding uh, proposition in terms of, of furthering all that, that we're trying to do. Um, and I think really what, when you're in a time of transition, transformation, uh, it is more important than, than ever. Amanda, would you agree that more collaboration between buyer and seller as, as we enter? Um, yeah, I mean, ironically, this space has really created uh, greater depth of dialogue, I think, between organizations. It's made the conversations with clients much richer around what actions really drive their business and deeper understanding around their audience, too, with all the sources of data. So as much as this is, again, programmatic, it's much more uh, a rich conversation, mm -hmm. a rich palette for us to work with with data that's getting us closer to what are the business results that together we can drive for our marketers. I think that's a really important point because it is really about the, the, the tools, like uh, having a full portfolio palette of tools that you can use to, to achieve the goal. Because if, if you let, if the ultimate goal is to connect the messaging to the consumer. So how do we do that in the most effective way? Raise engagement, do it efficiently, across all the platforms, hit all your KPIs, all those things, right? But you can't do that in silos. You have to do that across the board. You can't do that by being opposite sides of the desk. You almost have to be together and connected. You can't do that without all the benefit of the information that I know we as publishers share and I know you as advertisers have. And that we, if we can come together, then you have the portfolio. But if you look at it as just programmatic or just mm -hmm. direct, then you're missing the whole point. Right. You know? Oh, I think again back to uh, Rajiv's comment about the the holistic approach. Um, so, well, thank you all very, very much for joining us. Thank you for having us this morning. I'll see you.